Hello everyone and welcome to the MetaVance webinar series hosted by MetaVance Billing Service. Today's webinar is Accreditation, the ins, the outs, and everything in between. We have a great presentation in store for you, but before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Now we have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Now you have joined this presentation using listening on your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Now we have put all lines on mute to reduce any background noise. If you have any concerns with audio or visual, please message me through the chat window located to the right of your screen. You will also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your question into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now you will be receiving a link to review the recorded webinar and the slides in about two to three days. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Jennifer Flowers, President of Accreditation Guru. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm very happy to be here and discussing accreditation, the ins and outs and everything in between. I will just get started with an overview of today's agenda. We will be looking at the various benefits of accreditation and why you should be accredited in the first place. It will be a general overview of the three main accrediting bodies, the Joint Commission, CARF, and COA, or Council on Accreditation. We will discuss organizational requirements and who should be included in the process. Organizations becoming accredited often face similar challenges and tips will be provided on how to overcome such difficulties. Finally, we will talk about what makes for successful accreditation preparation. But before we get started, we would like to learn a little bit about the people who are on the phone today. Uh, with that, if you can look to the right of your screen and there will be a poll, just a quick yes, no, are you currently accredited? And for those, I hope you can find it. Um, just mark if you are currently accredited. And we might not have too many people. There we go. And we'll just let, give a second for these to come through. Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, that is perfectly fine. We'll just go on and continue with the presentation. Okay. Uh, with all the organizations I've worked with, once they are accredited, most cannot imagine not being accredited. But I have spoken to some, especially when first starting out, that think accreditation is a questionable value. So I'd like to take some time to highlight for you the many benefits of becoming accredited. Overall, client safety and quality of care issues are at the forefront of accreditation standards and initiatives. It will help improve agency administration and take an organization above and beyond being licensed. With regard to risk, there's always a focus on managing risk through implementation of accreditation standards. And, of course, when it comes to accreditation, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen, which leads to having improved written policies and procedures as well as various plans and performance reports. I tend to explain to people that we all know what we should be doing in terms of having everything documented, policies and procedures updated, staff trained, a focus on using data for performance improvement, risk management, et cetera. But normally we are not doing this because we're too busy running the organization providing services. Accreditation, in effect, does force you to get all of your ducks in a row and really take your organization to the next level. Some accredited healthcare organizations can qualify for Medicare and Medicaid certification without undergoing a separate government quality inspection, which eases the burden of duplicative federal and state regulatory agency surveys. Or accreditation may be mandated by a state licensing body. In some markets, accreditation is becoming a prerequisite for eligibility for insurance reimbursement and for participation in managed care plans or contract bidding. 
which means that private insurance carriers are now beginning to request treatment programs be accredited in order to receive reimbursement. And this is an interesting trend, as before it had generally been state or federal mandates that required accreditation, which is something that often would take years of lobbying and negotiations. But with private insurance carriers, they have the ability to potentially make a decision and move forward very quickly with their own mandate. By enhancing risk management efforts, accreditation may improve access to and or reduce the cost of liability insurance coverage. You should check with your insurance broker about this. And if he or she is not familiar with accreditation leading to possibly reduced rates, then ask them to make an inquiry for you. There are many benefits to creating a well-established integrated performance measurement program that will analyze the outputs and outcomes of both services provided and administrative areas. One example is using data to set organizational goals in a strategic planning process and help determine the achievement toward those goals. Also, performance measurement data can help to identify and prioritize opportunities for improvement. To be able to, tra to track progress from quarter to quarter and year to year, helping to take one's head out of the daily grind and possible crisis management mode, and instead look at the big picture and identify trends and areas in need for improvement. And we'll be discussing performance measurement and performance improvement again later in this webinar. The benefits of accreditation continue with recognition from governments, foundation, and grant makers. Many organizations find that they're able to reduce hidden costs through having more efficient processes and by strengthening capacity. One side note is that qualified personnel may prefer working with an accredited organization in part as the agency tends to provide additional opportunities for staff to develop their skills and knowledge, and it has a demonstrated commitment to quality. Achieving accreditation makes a strong statement to the community that an organization's efforts to provide the highest quality services. Further, accreditation may provide a marketing advantage in a competitive healthcare environment and improve the ability to secure new business. Sharing information with and soliciting input from your stakeholders helps in part with both transparency and learning about how others view your organization. And accreditation may also help an agency to adapt to the rapidly evolving behavioral health landscape and be better able to shift to new service and delivery models, strategically plan the future direction of the organization, partner with other providers, meet the needs of newly eligible clients, and restructure a payment system if needed. In general, the accrediting bodies are committed to giving behavioral health providers a framework that supports the services delivered and to ensure that they have necessary resources to address the differing needs of those who come into care. Here's just a short list of some state mandates. One tip, if you know of a state regulatory or funding mandate coming your way, I strongly recommend that you begin the process of becoming accredited as soon as possible. Keep in mind that the accrediting bodies only have so much capacity to review organizations. So do what you can to begin as early as feasibly possible in order to beat any potential rush related to a mandate. We'll now have a brief overview of the Joint Commission, CARF, and COA. And I do promise to keep this brief. There are other accrediting bodies such as ACHC, but we will keep the list focused for today. Overall, the programs accredited by Joint Commission, CARP, and COA include addictions and substance use disorders, case management, crisis intervention and stabilization, day treatment, detox, eating disorders, family preservation and wraparound services, inpatient treatment, mental health services, methadone and opioid treatment, residential treatment, and more. This is not an exhaustive list and you should check with your particular accrediting body. Looking at the Joint Commission, formerly known as JCO, it is a nationally recognized independent accreditor of hospitals, behavioral health care, laboratories, and more. It's a nonprofit that was established in 1951 and accredits more than 2,200 organizations under the Comprehensive Accreditation Manual for Behavioral Health Care. They have a three-year accreditation cycle. Any behavioral health care organization may apply for Joint Commission accreditation, but needs to have basic requirements in place, such as for those organizations providing methadone detox, at least three individuals need to have been treated. For all other organizations, three individuals with at least one active at the time of the initial on-site survey have been provided care, treatment, or services, 
and for orgs providing foster care, they have a minimum of three foster homes with two homes caring for at least one child. The Joint Commission's early survey option allows an organization new to Joint Commission accreditation to enter the process in two stages. This option is available for organizations currently or not yet providing care, treatment, or services, meaning brand new orgs. This option makes it possible to set up the business operations on the foundation of compliance with administrative and organizational requirements before the first individuals are served. The early survey option is different from a regular full survey in that this option consists of two on-site surveys. Uh, looking at CARF, one condition that must be met to be eligible for CARF accreditation is that for a minimum of six months prior to the on-site survey, each service for which the organization is seeking accreditation must demonstrate the implementation of CARF standards and they must be directly providing services. So what this means is that the standards must be in use and services must be actually provided both for at least six months prior to the survey. CARF is a three-year accreditation cycle and an organization is able to select one or more programs to be accredited. While this is an attract attractive option for some, I personally tend to recommend if you're bringing one program through that you go ahead and bring them all through. If you're making the effort to improve documentation, processes, and plans in one area, why would you exclude the, exclude the others from these benefits? You also don't want staff in the accredited program to think, why do we have to do all this extra work and the others don't? But the reverse can also be felt in the staff in a non-accredited program who may think, why are we being left out? And are we not as important or is our program not valued enough to become accredited? So that's just something to think about. Like the Joint Commission and CARF, COA accredits the full continuum of child welfare, behavior health, and community-based social services. They require that all programs and services for which COA has standards become accredited. And like CARF, there needs to be a record of implementation of the accreditation standards for at least six months. Uh, note here that COA has a four-year accreditation cycle. So if you are questioning which accrediting body is the best fit for your organization, you might want to consider the following. Matching your services provided to the available programs or categories offered for accreditation. Will all or only some services be accredited? And we just discussed a couple of pros and cons here. What accreditations are accepted by your funders? And do you anticipate merging or purchasing another organization? And is that organization already accredited? If yes, it might make sense to seek the same type of accreditation so that everyone is speaking the same language. But note that this is not required and one or the other could always switch in the future, but it's just something to take into account. One other factor is, of course, pricing, which differs between the three accrediting bodies. I do recommend that an organization pick the accreditation best suited to their particular needs and look at more than just cost. Any of the accreditors will be happy to provide you with a quote. But note that when figuring out the annual cost, you should divide the total cost by either three or four years, depending on the length of the accreditation cycle. All the steps prior to and all the steps after the on-site survey are focused on promoting optimal outcomes for the person served and for sustaining organizational success. The accreditation process starts with providers being committed to continuous quality improvement and to leadership supporting the process of seeking accreditation. It culminates with an external review and recognition that providers' business and service practices meet standards of quality. You will need to understand the accreditation process, which is one of the, one of the reasons for today's webinar, and review the accreditation requirements of the accrediting body you're considering working with. You then need to see how accreditation applies to your organization. You'll want to identify appropriate programs or categories for accreditation of the services provided, determine if all or some of the programs will be accredited, if that's allowed, and obtain copies of the accreditation standards. Joint Commission and CARF charge for their standards, and COA has them available on their website. You should be sure to provide an overview training to staff and board members, both to share information and gain the necessary buy-in. And keep in mind that project management is key, including important dates and who will be involved when. 
this is not a task to be completed by just one person. Everyone needs to be involved in the process somehow. When working with organizations, accreditation guru always strives to have an even flow of work in the months leading up to the accreditation survey. Then you'll want to conduct an initial self-assessment, which may be preliminary with a more thorough self-assessment or compilation of a self-study conducted once the standards are being followed. You'll want to compare the applicability of the accreditation standards to your current practices, identify areas needing improvement, and develop and implement improvement action plans for going forward. If you are interested, Accreditation Guru has a free self-assessment available to you as a starting point. It's on our website, and I'll provide you with a link at the end of this webinar. Then you'll submit an application and initial payment to the accrediting body at which time you will speak with the accreditor to clarify information and verify the programs to be accredited. This is to say you need to make sure that the accrediting body understands your services offered and applies the correct standards. It is not always perfectly clear. Preparation for an on-site survey includes everything from facilities review to evaluating the quality and completeness of case files and the employee or HR files against the accreditation standards. Preparation should ideally also include conducting mock interviews with staff, psychiatrists, and board members. On-site surveys are generally conducted by two or more surveyors for two up to four or even more days, depending on the size and complexity of the organization. And they involve the following. Tracing a client's experience, which is looking at the programs and services provided by various staff and departments as well as a handoff between them. And this is especially important with Joint Commission accreditation. On-site observations and interviews with staff, individuals served, and families, uh, where appropriate, will take place. Uh, reviews of documents provided by your organization and assessment of the safety of the physical facility will all happen during the on-site survey. After the on-site survey, you may be required to make improvements or corrections. And assuming accreditation is granted, there is an expectation of maintaining compliance with the standards and completing an annual maintenance of accreditation report. Following the investment of time, money, and effort it takes to become accredited, you should ensure that your agency is truly able to live accreditation in order to realize the full benefit and help ensure a smoother process when it's time to be re-accredited. You do not want to just leave it on a shelf, so to speak, and expect to pick it up three years later. Key areas addressed by the accrediting bodies include program, service, and structure, screening and access to service, person-centered plans, transition and discharge planning, medication management, if applicable, behavior support and management practices, the records of person served, as well as the case record review process and record management. There will also be a focus on performance improvement process, risk management, technology and security of information, and this area has become more and more of a focus of the accrediting bodies in the past couple of years, as well as personnel qualifications and competencies. Finally, accreditation also concentrates on leadership, care of the client, infection, prevention, control, and the physical environment. So I'm often asked, who should be involved? Well, everyone to some extent, including stakeholders. Do keep in mind that psychiatrists, whether they be contract or employed, need to participate both in terms of the documentation and participate in interviews. All staff should have a hand preparing for accreditation and understand the benefits of and reasons for seeking accreditation. Developing buy-in goes a long way to helping this process. Uh, I've mentioned stakeholders a couple of times, and they may include persons served, family members or guardians, referring agencies, partner organizations, board members, etc. So let's turn now to possible challenges faced when preparing for accreditation. A lack of documentation, 
often stems from the fact that people know what they're supposed to do and have been performing their jobs well for many years. So there's not a high level of documentation taking place. But keep in mind that in the world of accreditation, again, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. There may be one or more reasons that organizations struggle with collecting and analyzing data within a performance measurement and improvement system. Some of these include that they may believe there's not enough time, money, or expertise on hand. They may not want to discover negative findings, such as service flaws or other risks within the organization. Or they may think that things are going along well enough, so why make the effort? Others may be overwhelmed with administrative duties and not want to take on one more responsibility. I'm sure at least some of the people on the phone today can relate to that. Uh, leadership must initiate and support performance measurement and help overcome staff resistance if any are present. As you know, being in a rapidly evolving industry means that there's already so much to keep up with. The organizations may feel there's no time left over to work on accreditation itself. However, one point that's often overlooked is that accreditation helps an agency to think strategically and better adapt to changing behavioral health landscape. One side note is that the size of an organization does not matter. The accreditation standards are the same whether you have six or 600 employees. It's all a matter of how you implement the standards. Challenges also include that staff are already working at 100 or 110 percent and do not have any extra time. Or they don't understand the importance of accreditation and why it matters to them, so they're not going to want to make the extra time available. Uh, you may have limited or zero understanding of the standards. And for those of you that have already looked into either the accreditation standards or the process itself, if you think that it's all written in Greek, just know that you are not alone. That is a typical feeling when folks are starting out. But it can be made sense of and put into a very organized format. Uh, a challenge is that project management is not thorough enough. Uh, issues with delegation and authority might be there, and also trying to rush to the finish line. So what to do about this? Here are a few tips to keep in mind for successful road to accreditation. Staff buy-in is key to both working toward becoming accredited and keeping up with the implementation of the standards going forward. Project management should ensure a relatively smooth flow of work throughout the whole preparation process. I've heard horror stories of agencies leaving everything to the end, pulling all-nighters, stressing out staff, and inevitably struggling greatly to get accredited if they're able to do so at all. You need to plan ahead and do the work early. Um, also, you need to have the right players in place, and don't forget inv about involving your stakeholders. Support from leadership is key, as is being able to live accreditation once it's been earned. Otherwise, you have made a significant investment in time, money, and effort, and this is whether or not you work with an accreditation consultant, and it's a grave disservice to become accredited and then not keep up with it. I can also tell you that while support from leadership will not guarantee success, if leadership does not support and encourage the accreditation process, you are guaranteed to have problems along the way. A few resources for you, uh, the websites for Joint Commission, CARF, and COA, and, and also, as I mentioned, a free self-assessment can be found on our homepage. Uh, the initial questions are really to identify what type of accreditation you are looking to go after, and then a full free self-assessment will be sent to you. And here are a few ways to connect with and follow Accreditation Guru. I welcome you to like us on Facebook, follow the blog, and connect on Twitter and LinkedIn. We also have a monthly newsletter with tips and articles related to accreditation. And I thank you very much. We will have time for uh, Q&A, um, but I hope that you have found this webinar to be useful. And as mentioned previously, a copy of the slides will be made available to you. And do feel free to contact me after the webinar if you have any questions that we've discussed today or any other questions about accreditation, strategic planning, performance measurement programs, involving stakeholders, or anything else. And I definitely thank everyone for 
their participation. At this point, are there any questions? Okay, it looks like um, we don't have any questions at this time. But again, yeah, if you have any questions that you couldn't think of right now, um, Jennifer's information is right there on the screen for you. You can um, contact her at jennifer at accreditationguru.com or the number right there, 212-945-8504. And again, we want to thank you so much, Jennifer, for this um, great information, and we want to thank everyone else for attending this MetaVance webinar series hosted by MetaVance Billing Service. Now, again, once you leave today's webinar, um, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we'd appreciate it if you would complete the survey and provide us your feedback. And you will also receive a follow-up email within two to three days with a link to view a recording of today's webinar, and we'll also have the slides available for you. This um, a webinar accredited the ins, the outs, and everything in between. On behalf of MetaVance Billing Service and our presenter, Jennifer Flowers, we want to thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.